I recently judged a drum contest with our special guest, after which he did a great drum clinic, showing you exactly what you're supposed to do. I have some questions about that. You know him from his amazing work with Animals as Leaders. Matt Garska, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I think I first heard about you, and correct me, it was going back a few years, uh, on a DVD, on a Gospel Chops DVD? Yep the okay. second or no it was the third gospel chops dvd that was released that was uh, the first one you were on though is that right yeah 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 question how did that happen and how did you get your gospel chops together that's a question a lot of young drummers out there are going to want to know well um how do gospel drummers get their gospel chops together i think that's, <laughs> the that's first a question, big question gotta... too right <laughs> um you know they're not sitting there uh, studying out of books. And th this is something that um, I like come to like fully realize now. And I, I kind of realized at the time. Um, but um, I I've come more so to realize that there's like kind of this chasm between, you know, the rock and the institutionalized and, and you know, jazz way and um, yeah, institutionalized, I guess, like colleges and stuff, like the way we're learning from sheets of paper. And it's like, here's this material. And then there's, you know, I think more Afrocentric uh, styles of music that are more about acquiring music through osmosis and by by hearing and, and feeling, um, which is ultimately what we're doing. So, I mean, that I think that should always come really first um the other stuff i think is just like really uh supplementary um so yeah uh gospel cats they're they're just they're listening to a lot of music they're they're watching a lot of sheds um i was hanging with um a lot of gospel cats at at berkeley um and yeah we we just would shed as much as we possibly could and uh there's like a double room in uh, one of the Berkeley uh, practice rooms, you know, so like Two we would, sets. yep, <laughs> we would go ham in that room. Um, and uh, yeah, there are cats from DC, cats from Philly, cats from Cali, you know, cats from all over um, kind of coming together and, and shedding and, you know, sharing uh, licks. And just like, you know, putting yourself, I think, in the the hot seat and like, it's like you have to shred now and like kind of putting your system, your physical system through that, but also your your brain, like, this is the tempo, this is where we're shedding now play some crazy stuff. So um, that, the, that's defining for the kids the word shed so they understand two drummers getting together and and basically you you start off with a groove and you you trade fours or trade eights back and forth that's basically what a shed is but a shed can also be like it can also be a big church event where a bunch of players come out and it's not just relegated to drummers uh i think m the most common shed is with drummers but uh yeah it can also be like you know a bunch of guitar players key players ham ham and you know organ players um yeah uh so i think shedding is a big part of kind of honing that in um but for me you know like like also another thing i think to consider is like you know in 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 churches they're exposed to playing weekly or hearing music weekly every sunday right so like a lot of these cats have been playing since they were three or four years old or five years old and um, getting that opportunity every week is like it builds something slowly, but still has a powerful effect when you're starting that young. So, um, you know, I think that's that's part of what helps kind of assimilate some of these chops and grooves um, in such a natural way. Uh, so, you know, I didn't have that growing up. Um, you know, I grew up 
my dad, you know, bought a music store when I was eight and he was a professional guitarist. So I was, I was exposed to a lot of music, but it wasn't like, Hey, here's a situation where you get to play in front of people weekly, you know? Um, so I was trying to acquire the, these sort of chops, um, through just sheer practice. Just, I'm going to work on these patterns, clean them up. And, um, I mean, it definitely helped me a lot, but, uh, it's definitely not the final touch touches, you know, like the final touches I think are ultimately kind of allowing those patterns to, uh, settle in your system and just kind of like moving past them in a way. Um, and not being so bogged down by, oh, am I going to play this pattern and that pattern? And then, then I can mix it with this. Oh, what about this five pattern? Like it's, it's less about that. And it's more just about like hearing something and just going for it immediately and not questioning and not letting that filter that is might cool come up with some cool stuff and some crafty things, you know, um, I think you got to kind of mute that part of your brain and just allow music to flow through you. In your practice days, interesting for drummers to hear, how many, how many hours a day did you practice just to get your technique, your technical facility? Uh, six to eight from like age 15 or 16. Um, it was six to eight hours all the way up until I was like 22, 23. Um, and that's when I kind of moved out to LA and, um, you know, real life can hit hard sometimes and you're, and you're broke as hell. So <laughs> you're trying to, trying to pay rent and figure stuff out. It gets a little tricky. Uh, but like, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, nearly 10 years there, um, I was doing six to eight hours a day and, you know, it wasn't always like, uh, technical focus and this is like i kind of realized there's a yin and yang and yes it was mostly technical it was like oh i'm gonna do double bass chops for a half hour i'm gonna do double bass work for a half hour i'm gonna do latin patterns for an hour i'm gonna do you know syncopation jazz stuff for an hour i'm gonna do just working with a slow click and grooving for like a half hour and then I'm going to work on a subdivided click, a super subdivided click, whether it be 16th notes, 32nd notes, 16th note triplets for another half. And I'd just like kind of like really hone in and be like very OCD about it. But like there was always this other time that I would allow myself to just be completely free. And um, when I really scrimped on that stuff, like just allowing myself to flow and just just be and not worry about you know being the best or trying to implement the newest thing that i had um when i when i scrimped on that and didn't do that i felt uh everything was very much inside of my head and um i think a lot of people can relate to this if they're really going hard um the opposite problem of this is like i'm sick of all my same old stuff you know it's like well you're not doing enough new stuff you're not putting enough new stuff you're spending too much time playing around and just allowing yourself to be and not really acquiring anything new um so i think it's important for players to go through a phase where it's more technical it's more about amassing a lot of facility and kind of uh honing in your your intellect and your computing power or whatever, assimilating a lot and crystallizing information. But eventually, you must reap the harvest of what you've made um, or what you've built uh, and work on, you know, you can, you can work on all the patterns in the world, but it doesn't mean you know how to put them together. It doesn't mean that you know how to, to flow from one idea to another and, and link them magically without even trying. Um, so that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah. Something you do so well too. That's something, one of the notes I made here that I wanted to go 
through with you, we'll touch on in a couple of minutes, which is the way you do that even within odd time signatures, which makes it more difficult. But I want to replay for all of you out there watching, uh, as you just went through your daily practice routine, talking about the number of minutes that you spent on something or hours that you spent on something. If you're seeing this live, go on to Drum Channel and review it again and write that down and make that one of your practice days because all the great drummers that we have here on the site and all of your friends and uh, I hear them uh, talk about the years, the woodshed years, I guess I would call them, when you really put in, you know, your dues in order to get to the point to where you're at. And I think a lot of young drummers just think, well, you're just, you're born that way or I can do a half hour a day or look at some YouTube videos and I'll get it because they're copying what you do a lot of times in like doing covers of some of the great Animals of Leader songs. But it's like, what's behind the scenes that got you the gig? What's, what's the work that you got to get to the point where you had the musicianship in order to- You're seeing you the song, you know, the Animals as Leaders song, but to make that song and to write those parts and craft them the way that I did, I had to know this much, you know? So like, you can you can play, you know, learn the song, but like also try to pick apart like how things are kind of functioning and like, you know, yeah, break it down and, and rebuild it in a variety of different ways. Because, you know, ultimately, that's like what's going on with me. I feel like, you know, ugh, people only get to see a fraction of like what I'm capable of or like what I'm you know, what I've worked on because I've, you know, you, you go through like a system of patterns, a bunch of systems of patterns and, um, you know, you might not play them all and people are only getting to see a, a portion. That's just the portion that came out when I was playing. Um, so I think it's important for, for people to understand, like there's, there's a lot more underneath the surface. It's like a glacier, you know, you see, you see the top, but like there's a lot more facility and, and foundation that it takes to, you know, kind of pull this stuff off. It just, you know, in the moment. You state that so well. And we talk about it on Drum Channel, but uh, you, you, you beautifully stated it. We kind of break things down on how you play, what you play and why you play it. And it's the how mm. that gives you the facility, the woodshed years. What you play is looking at and copying, you know, all of your idols. And the key ingredient that you explained so beautifully is why you play it. And that's the that's where you're hearing the tip of the iceberg. You know, you can copy somebody, but what is it that made him play what he played or not play at that particular point that made it all feel so good? I guess that that's what it keeps coming back to is just the, the feeling. Uh, and I was looking at the drum contest that we judged um, and there was great drummers that were on the panel uh, as we were watching the contestants. And then you came up and did your clinic afterwards. And, and I remember within the first two or three bars, I turned to Glenn Sobel and we both just said, it's day and night. I mean, you know, the, the obviously you're going to outplay all of the contestants, but it was even beyond that. It was like, what are these kids all missing is the question that I asked when I was, when I was looking at that. And I think you've hit on a lot of that here. You know, 30,000 hours. That's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> But what what would be the main things you would think if we were having an opportunity to sit down with you know those drummers or young drummers to kind of tell them you know this is you you got we heard you play everything that you practiced but emphasizing what you just said how do you get to the point where you can kind of let that go and flow through you yeah it's it's just a matter of time you know um you know and it's a matter of like concentration too, like concentration of practice. You know, if you're, you know, you can maybe by the time you're 80 years old, you can amass 30,000 hours of practice, you know, from when you're eight years old to when you're, you know, 70 or 80 years old and you say, Hey, I did 30,000 hours and I'm not a master. What's going on here. <laughs> but like all, part of it's like concentration of, you know, how much practice you're doing in, in, a, in a short period of time. Um, but like for, for those contestants, you know, I, I would say like, yeah, it's just a matter of putting in more time and getting more and more familiar with, with what they're playing and trying to flip it for lack of some precise technical term. 
um, because I, I like the word flip it because it's like, it's just like, it could mean play it backwards. It could mean play what you're playing with your hands, with your feet, or it could, it could mean so many different things. And that's the point. <laughs> like that's part of uh, your personality that comes out is what you choose to experiment with in the practice room and you know what you choose to continue to play and kind of hone in on that's that's your taste and um yeah that's that's developed over time too so it's 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 all just a matter of time and they were playing they had like a three minute solo opportunity and within uh any drummer's career when you play a solo do you think of song form during a solo i know it's something that you use so well that was, you know, uh, obvious when when you started playing was your use sense of dynamics. They had very little use of dynamics. How important are those things when you sit down behind the drums? Uh, for me, I've been like heavily focused on dynamics lately. What what's the other thing that you said though? Well, dynamics, um, song form, thinking song music, form. As you're playing a solo, do you think of uh, or so, starting having a beginning, a middle, and, a, and an end to it? So for like jazz, I think having some sort of song form is is of great importance. Um, and playing with animals live, you know, in the event that I'm doing a solo, it's it's we're playing to tracks, so it is a set amount of time. Um, so yeah, there's no break in the form there. Uh, but if it's just an open drum solo, like. I like to be completely open. Um, and I, and I, I've gone through phases where I'm like, this is an open drum solo, but I'm going to start with this and then I'm going to go into this section. Then I'm moving to that. Then I'll do this. And, <laughs> um, just sometimes it just doesn't go well. And it just <laughs> really takes away from the moment. Um, for, for me, as of late, what I'm really trying to hone in on is the ability to truly live in the moment and to um, express myself, be in the moment and express that, um, be a human being. So like, it's not just that I'm, when I'm sitting down, I'm thinking, okay, be present on the drums. It's like, no, I'm, I'm trying to do this in life as well because I know they're pretty interconnected. So trying to be more conscious of, uh, yeah, where I'm spending my, my time and how, how I'm spending it and that my head's not somewhere else. Um, so I think that's like a consciousness thing, but yeah, you, with my solos, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from is like, I want to live in the moment and I feel confident and comfortable enough now with the amount of facility that I have that um, I can make some sort of drama, you know, or make, tell some sort of story because like, I want to hear a story. I don't know what the story is. I'm on the edge of my seat, you know? So it's like, I like that sort of freedom because I, I don't know what I'm going to play next. <laughs> Y'all don't know what I'm going to play next. I don't know what I'm going to play next. So it's like, you know, I also get to be the listener and and you put yourself in, in that um, seat. You played a lot of tracks when you did the the clinic. And I think what, what I felt and what the other drummers felt there was that even though I'm sure you'd played those tracks and those songs many times, still watching you do it, you almost felt like this was the first time you were going through it. There, there was a... a you i felt exactly what you're explaining right now it wasn't like mm -hmm. you know what's coming up and you know what you're going to play it's like you were living in the moment even playing to a track which is interesting because you're not having a conversation at that point because that conversation is happening you're playing along to it yeah yeah those songs have been like rehearsed to the nth degree um that's awesome to hear because i kind of feel like it is a sort of chasm you know like i've develop this ability to basically play note for note and to hone in on my arrangements of these tunes and like remember every single note in, pretty much in the song and um that to me seems so different than just improvising and letting 
bygones be bygones and you know just just going for it and living in the moment so like <clears throat> it's cool to hear that there's still life in there because i feel like that's part of what makes improvisation so exciting is that you know we don't know what's going to happen next um so like it's very it's it's like water is flowing through us you know life is flowing through that that moment um but also there's a there's a powerful thing to honing in on like you know nobody's gonna sing um uh, well i do i i'll, I'll sing a <laughs> I'll sing a Charlie Parker jazz solo <laughs> that was completely improvised, but like, you know, my teachers made me do it. <laughs> they're like, do this. But like most people, they're not going to sing that. They're going to sing like some rock song or like, you know, oh, oh, well, halfway there. so like, you know, there's something to like making a hook or some sort of, uh, thing for people to latch on to that's like no this is the this is the one thing um but then there's also you know the improvisation so i'm i'm actually trying to figure out how to kind of merge these worlds in in prog because prog is very much like like metal where everything is predetermined and i, I think if we can also get like an element of improvisation in there it's like game over you then you do have the ultimate progressive music you know it's progressed intellectually and spiritually let me replay this matt garska can sing a charlie parker jazz solo is that what i heard <laughs> that says yeah, it all uh, in my book no no wonder you're doing what you're doing yeah my teacher bob galat when, when i was like 15 or 16 i realized like well, my mentor, Joe Salins, he told me like, you know, look at you like Dave Weckl, you like Vinnie Caliuta, you like Steve Gadd, uh, Gary Novak, all these drummers I've been showing you. Well, they all know how to swing their asses off. So you better learn how to swing. And I'm like, I'm a rock drummer. I don't <laughs> I like punk. I like I like the Latin stuff. I like the funk stuff. I, but I can't swing, you know, so I, like I went to a teacher, Bob Galati, who uh, was in this uh jazz group called the fringe and uh with george garzon a beast of a sax player in boston and he made me basically learn all these elvin jones and um elvin jones transcriptions and he's like he he's the one who taught me permutations like taking a 16th note groove permutating it over 16th note he's the one who taught me quintuplets and septuplets and you know 11 tuplets and all this stuff and he's the one who made me work through the Charlie Parker Omni book, which is a book of like over a hundred saxophone heads and solos. So like I got through, I didn't finish the book. I got through like 70 of them or something like that, but that's a lot of Charlie Parker solos. You, you took the wind out of my next question. Cause it was, how do you make everything swing? Cause I hear that in your playing. Uh, and you can make straight eighth, you can, all the genres of music that you play can have a swing effect to them. And we don't think of swing so much when I talk about it on drum channel as like an old style of music. It's more of a feel, a jazz interpretation mm. of whatever you're, whatever rock, whatever you're playing. Um, and something else that uh, is just outstanding to me when I see you play, um, you seem so relaxed at the end of the song as much as you are at the beginning of the song. I mean, I, is that something that you worked on acquiring or you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you just you um, comfortable and relaxed. Like I just did it. That's the end of that song. I'm moving on to the next one. <laughs> well, when I first joined animals, um, well, let, let's go back. Like I first joined this punk band when I was like 15 years old and it was all about you know, playing hard, hitting hard, just going fast. Like, you know, it's, it's a basically a middle finger to society. <laughs> so like you do what you want <laughs> and it's aggressive. So like when I started to play like this way, like my, my, my grip tensed up, my forearms got like super tight. Like, you know, at, like I was like, holy crap, I'm playing harder than I've ever played and you know this is like it's very physically strenuous but 
I, I kind of started to figure out, I need to find a way to like hone in on my, my technique while also still playing very aggressively. How do, how do I merge these two worlds or is it just two different things? I'm either playing like super bashy or, you know, I've got my, all my beautiful flowiness, you know, um, I don't know, finessed stuff. Um, so eventually, yeah, joined animals and kind of the same sort of thing was happening where I'm playing very aggressively. And part of it's the adrenaline that you have when playing in front of a crowd. It amps your adrenaline up. It, it amps your strength and speed up. But, you know, you don't feel it. So you're playing harder and faster, but you don't feel it until your system gets worn down. And then you're like, holy crap, I'm super worn down like what's going on well you're you're going you're going very ham is what's going on um and probably dropping some techniques so for me it's been um qu quite a journey trying to control my emotion just a tiny bit so that i'm not completely out of control and letting myself uh get to those degrees of fatigue where i'm unable to execute properly so you know i don't, think, I don't, I don't know maybe that, my conditioning is just really good now yeah i don't think that affects one's attitude i mean you can play correctly and have somewhat of a jazz sensibility physically in your playing i think and still have an attitude that comes out that makes it everything you'd want to, to meet the demands of that adrenaline going you know uh, and maybe even more yeah I mean, I look at Chad Smith, I look at great, you know, rock drummers. Uh, I mean, the antithesis of that would be Charlie Watts. He's, he still played like he was in a jazz club. Uh, you know, just crank it up in the volume if you need me to a little bit louder. But, but yeah. there, was, there was an intensity to that and an attitude towards that that comes through, which comes through your playing too. At the end, you don't, it doesn't seem any more relaxed. It seems like, you know, and speaking of time feel and relaxed or intense, um, do you think of where you're putting the time within the pulse or the beat in terms of going with the bass player and having being a little bit on top or pulling a little bit back? The idea of that stress and release I hear so many great drummers talk about. I don't really play with that when playing with animals, uh, simply because everything is to track. And so uh, the more the most precisely I can play, the better. Um, but I have gotten um, less Nazi-like in my <laughs> attitude towards how much I must be on the click. Um, and now it's more like it's there. It's piercing in my ears, so it's not like I can't hear it. Um, but if I like rush a little bit or drag a little bit, um, as long as what I played feels good. And it wasn't like some, you know, sometimes you drag something or, or rush it a little bit and you, you get this like little, uh, imperfection. That's not like it doesn't have character in a good way. It's just sloppy, you know? So like, as long as it's, as long as it's still sounding good and it's, you know, pushing or pulling or whatever, I'm, you know, I'm more open to that nowadays than, than I used to be. Um, but like I said, you know, maybe you need to go through more of that period where I think most people do, you know, most players, you know, it takes a very advanced player to, to be able to speed up and slow down and, and it be okay. Uh, I think it's a pitfall that a lot of drummers need to look out for is just allowing themselves to, oh yeah, man, I just push and pull cause it feels, it feels good and it's just natural. And it's like, yeah, maybe you don't have control though, I think is what it is. <laughs> so you gotta you gotta be careful with that. Um, you know, you gotta do your due diligence and be able to really hone in to a click and then beyond that, allow your natural feel to um emanate out of that. But then again, you know, like Chad Smith, you know, very natural player. Um, I think he's just naturally got his feel and it's not perfect to a grid. So like, uh, 
you know, I, I don't know if he went through crazy periods where he really honed in on like, you know, like a subdivided click, but like his feel is Chad Smith for it's just like almost inherent in him. And most of us got to work on that. Like we got to first adjust our time to the grid, be able to play in time very well and then be like, OK, now how do I push and pull and how do I, you know, make things feel fatter and better? And um, some guys just they do just have it. <laughs> they got it like that. How was your experience at Berkeley? How important do you think that was to your to your overall career and recommending that higher levels of education to young drummers out there? 